Today is the 15th of January, and once again, we are back at our buddy Glenn King's place, and he has all the antennas on his uh, tower. Now, it's not often we get a chance to see this, not, you know, up close where the thing is down low, where we can actually point and observe and talk about it. Normally, they're way up in the air, and the only thing we can do is use our finger about what's this and what's that. Well, not here. Glenn's going to give us the opportunity. I'm going to talk to him about this. This will probably be... A little longer video on what you're used to seeing but this is for the benefit of those who have never had the opportunity to see this stuff up close which includes myself new ham operators maybe some of the old guys that have never had an opportunity to look at it uh, maybe they've had different antennas and not seen some of these so what we're going to do look at the size of this one antenna next to Glenn here and that's the largest antenna that is a Yagi antenna watch my finger it goes all the way up that's 18 feet all the way up each of those extend out and that is the 2015 and 10 meter antenna what kind of antenna is it it's a Yagi beam made by high gain high gain is there a number for it a model number or anything like that th uh, what is it what is it again th5 t as in tango th5 the th5 if I were to go out and buy something like that what would it cost me approximately $700, eight seven or eight hundred dollars. <laughs> I didn't realize it cost that much. Now, of course, this is, you didn't you didn't buy it new. But it, there are somebody out there who has bought this new at one time, and you know we, we as hams can take the benefit of them getting tired of it or retiring just it. retiring it and getting something new. And that's what you have done, right, Glenn? Mm -hmm. Seven eight hundred dollars. All right, now let's uh, Let's take a look at the uh, second part of this thing. Now, right here we have an antenna that goes straight out on the end of the boom. Here's your boom, going or your tower going all the way down. He had to build another uh, <laughs> another support, by the way, because this this Yagi was so huge. Incidentally, I wanted to cover one thing on this Yagi antenna. I talked with uh, Glenn about it already. The term Yagi is no big thing. You know, it, it's referred to. Uh, by many people as a Yagi antenna. What happened was there was a guy in Japan in 1926. His name was uh, Uru, I believe it was. Uh, Uda, U-D-A. In 1926, a guy by the name, a Japanese fellow by the name of Uda. Now this was a time before voice communications came to be with uh, ham radio. It was all Morse code or CW, continuous wave. In 1926, he invented what he referred to as a beam antenna, which is what you see right here, only it was much smaller. You know, it was only about maybe three feet, four feet long, and each of the elements that you see here would have only been about, you know, maybe a foot. I think it was like a four element beam antenna. Now, his protege, his buddy, his friend, they never did find out how he was connected to this Uda guy. But in 1929, a guy by the name of uh, Yagi brought that antenna to the United States, you showed everybody, and it was an instant success, an instant hit. Everybody loved it, and from then on, this type of beam antenna has been called a Yagi, after the guy named Yagi who brought this thing to the United States. But it was actually invented by Shintaro Uda, U-D-A. So a little bit of history there, okay? So Yagi is just a term, you know, based on the... It's kind of interesting that Uda invented it, but Yagi got all the credit from that day on. But anyway, getting back to this antenna right here, this is the... Uh, this one on the end you see right here, this is the 2 meter and 70 centimeter. Now the 2 meters would be uh, 144 to 148 megacycles. Now this is a dual bander, am I correct? Correct. Okay, two in one antenna, right? And the 70 centimeters is 420 to 450 megahertz. So both of those frequencies would be used by that single antenna. What kind of antenna is that, Glenn? It's a diamond. And the model number is X200. Diamond X200. Okay. Now we move down to the next antenna, which is another Yagi antenna, another beam antenna right here. Now that is the six meter antenna. And that covers the frequency range of 50 to 54 megahertz. And what model number is that? I do not know the model number. It's made by Cushcraft. Cushcraft, okay. Now you you say you tuned all of that. You tuned both of these beam antennas. There was no need to tune the uh, 70 centimeter and two meter, correct? It's good. It's good. But you did have to tune both the six 
and the, the 2015 and 10. The 20 by. I wanted to operate. That's that's what. I set them where I wanted to operate. Oh, the given frequency that you so you're not going to be changing frequencies a lot. You're stuck on that frequency once you tune it in. It's not a, hey, it's a band of frequency. A band. I mean, yeah, give or it, take. It's I, pretty bad. This one will cover all the all the bands. Oh, that covers that the entire band. Bands. What about the six meters? That cover the six entire. Six meter, just the bottom end. The bottom end. Why the bottom end? Because that's where the CW and single side band is. I'm not interested in FM. Okay. All six right. Meters. Okay. Now, I don't want to get too heavily into the antenna stuff or, you know, really deep because, number one, I don't understand a lot of it. Uh, it's on the Internet. If you want to find out about Yagi beam antennas, uh, uh, you can find out about it. But I just want you to know what they are. Now, the 20 meter, this is a 20, a 15, and uh, a 10. The 20 meters is 14 to 14.35 14 megahertz. The 15 is 21 to 21.45 megahertz, and the 10 meter is 28 to 29.7 megahertz. Now you've tuned each one of these individually to your preference. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Now, on the will it cover the entire band on 20 meters? Yes. We're talking about this large antenna still yes. here, okay? 20 meters is fully covered. Fully covered. What about the 15 and 10? So 15 is 10 meter. It's the bottom. End up to about 29 megahertz. Up to 29. Well, that's pretty close to the. That's pretty close to the top. It's, it's FM above 29 megahertz. Yeah, Glenn knows this stuff off the top of his head. He's he's done it for. You've done this what a couple of weeks now, right? A couple of weeks. Couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see what is next. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we let me get around this thing. I don't want to. You can see how long these. Now, how long are each one of these sides, by the way? Do you know? There. They're uh, 20 meter wavelength. Yeah, no wonder. I mean, that's pretty long. Yep. All right, let's get over here. And now we're going to take a look at the, uh, this is the 80 right here? Or the 40? That's the 80 meter broadband dipole. Okay. Inverted V. Okay, this, this thing you see right here is kind of interesting. This is the 80 meter broadband dipole. Inverted V. Inverted V, which and basically it. means the antenna will come down at a vertical slope. From, the, from its connection point, which is that bar right there. That's just there to hold it. And this thing right here you see is a mechanism where the, you know, the cable goes in. That's just to hold it also. This thing will slope down and attach to, do you say the fence over here in one point? It's over there in a tree. And the other point will be over here in a tree somewhere. Uh -huh. And it will be an inverted V that looks like this, right? It just like, like, just it like that. Like an inverted V. Yep, upside and it'll be spread v. out upside down V. Now, so that's the 80. Now, the 80 meter is 3.5 to 4.0 megahertz. So that's just a wire antenna, is what we're looking at right there. And it, it's good, it's less than 2 to 1 SWR all the way. And this is your wire on the ground. Now, right. where does the actual antenna end? Is it right here? No, it's it's over there. Oh, okay, it's, so it's over there somewhere. So this is it's all. It's 120 feet long. Okay, I see what's going on. And it's 64. It's so, 64 feet or 62 feet. Okay, so that's the 80. Now let's go to the other side of the horizontal bar here, and we wind up looking at the last antenna, which is the 40 meter. 40 meter inverted V. Now this is a 40 meter right here. The 40 meters is going to be 7 to 7.3 megahertz. Same thing, an inverted V like this. So we have a bunch of uh, beam antennas. We have a, uh, a vertical pole antenna for the 2 meter and 70 centimeter. And then we have those inverted V antennas which will be ta attached over there and over there. Interesting stuff, Glenn. Interesting stuff. Uh, let me see. Did you cut you kind of put this together yourself on these inverted V's? Did you? Yeah, these are self-made antennas. Yeah, yeah, I made okay. The the, uh, the 80 meter broadband uh -huh. comes from the ARRL antenna handbook. Oh, cool. And it's made just exactly all the dimensions and everything just like it's in the handbook. And this is the second one I've had. The first one lasted 20 years. And How about the, that? The, uh, the uh, coax that it's made from it's made from uh, uh, RG8 type coax was beginning to show a lot of weather yeah. so I just uh, uh, replaced it. It still had probably another 10-15 years life <clears throat> in it but while I was doing all this new I, w I just decided to change it. Yeah, good idea, good idea. The uh, 
this pole here, like I said, is the new pole that he's using to hold up this end of the antenna because this thing is so large. This is the original one right here that he was going to use, but fooled you, didn't it? <laughs> it was good for the six meter. Yeah, good for the six, that's I about it, yeah. Okay, now let's talk about this ARRL hand, and it's called the antenna handbook, right? Antenna handbook. Good, good little thing to have for new hams, right? Yes. If, yeah. you're, if you're interested in building antennas, it is a must-have. Even if you only put one antenna up, you should probably have that book. You, you know it gives you a choice of what you're, what you're going to do. You know, one of the problems we have here is this is kind of an addictive, thi addictive thing. You get one antenna, you want two. You get two, you want three. <laughs> There's no end to it, you know. Okay, let's, a couple of general questions. Uh... The repeaters, I think I've already said, are used for the uh, 2 meter and 70 centimeters. In Arkansas, we have both the 2 meters and 70 centimeters, and we even have some that is maintained by our own club. Isn't that right? That's right. That's right, right here in Conway, Arkansas. Right. The 6 meter. Why did you want to have a 6 meter? Very important uh, questions that people would want to know. Why? I have the space, and I'm interested in the band. What the heck with it? It's, you got plenty of space. Go for it, right? <laughs> go you, for it. You go for and it. You I had, had, and I had the you, That's right. Why let it lay on the ground, right? <laughs> okay, now what? what is kind of a neat thing about the six meter antenna? I mean, what? when the uh, sunspot cycle is in, in the right, when it's uh, working, it's one of the magic bands. It's like 10 meters. With 100 watts of power or a whole lot less than that, anywhere in the world. Now, I think you told me that you bought that from a, a silent key, right? Yes. He bought this six meter from a silent key, and what did you tell me about his transmission capability and receipt capability when he had it? He uh, worked all states and uh, on uh, CW, uh -huh. six meter CW, uh -huh. and also on uh, a digital mode called RTTY. Mm -hmm. He worked all states on RTTY. And he had approximately, I don't know exactly, but 30 to 40 countries wow. on six meters. Well, are you going to be using this six meter primarily on uh, Morse code, CW, or voice, or CW, phone, rather? Both. So you can do both. I do both. Okay. Do you do much uh, CW at all? Oh, yes. So you're into that CW about, about stuff. half my activity. Really? Is, is CW. How about that? And, of course, the 40 and 80, uh, you're going to use just probably standard. Well, I guess you'll use CW on that, too, wouldn't you? Yeah. And phone. Our phone is voice, yep. for those that don't know. And getting back to, in the beginning, for those that don't know, I'll repeat it, the ham radio, when it started out, was strictly Morse code. Huh? When did it actually go to voice? Any idea? Early 50s? It late a, 40s? It was, a, it was a slow transition. Yeah. Uh, Morse code has always been yeah. uh, popular with yeah. the hams. Yeah. And... Uh, so, I don't know when it switched to where there more than half the people in amateur radio were on voice, but it's been within the last probably 30 to 40 years. Okay, so well, when did it basically, when was it able to kick over is what I'm saying. I mean, when did it become available? About the early, late 40s, I guess? No, it was before then. Before then, okay. Yes, they, they were, uh, things started switching back in the 1930s. Oh, really? And, uh, oh. of course, when the war yeah. came out, yeah. it, it, uh, uh, everything became very, yeah. very much, a lot yeah. of advancements yeah. during, during yeah. the war. Of course, the hams weren't much involved in that. Yeah. They, yeah. they couldn't even use their own frequencies during the war, but uh, it was all available again after the war. Well, then what, they shut them down, did they, yes. you, you, for use with the military took for their, the war? Even took their equipment. No kidding. Well, that's what you did. Well, how about that? Just think the screaming and hollering that would happen Oh, my today. God, today, my God. <laughs> they always talk about whining. We got enough whining going on at the moment. We don't need any more of that. All right. Okay, well, I appreciate it. That's all I want to talk about. Again, here's our rotor. For those of you uh, who don't recall, this whole series started out with mishmash number 135. I'll put in the last mishmash video. Uh, was the second part. This is the third part. There's one more part to go. Once we get the antenna all up and we get the wires in and everything, I want to come back up and watch you turn on your radio and watch this stuff work. Are you agreeable with that? I'm agreeable. Okay, let's do the last part of this video. The second part of our video is going to involve, we've done the, you know, we've done the antennas and we're going to crank this baby up, by the way, before, before I leave here, we're going to crank it up, right? Yep. Okay. The second part is the grounding. Grounding is very important on this stuff, not only for the antenna itself, but for your equipment inside the house, your transceiver, 
and whatever else you've got in there that needs to be grounded. Now, uh, Glenn, he, I just went over this entire grounding system with him. I'm going to let him kind of go over it uh, a second time. But he's got grounding rods down through the concrete. Now, this concrete is supporting this base you told me is how deep? Five feet thick. Five feet, five feet, and the grounding rods go below the concrete. How far? Another five feet. Another five feet. So these are actually ten foot grounding rods. Yeah. Okay, ten foot grounding rods. All of these here are ten foot grounding three rods. Of them under okay, the tower. he's got three of them under the tower, and then he's got some more. Uh, point out the rest of the grounding rods there. You've got one grounding rod over there, here, here. These are the yeah. three. Here, here, and over here. Now you can see the wires. Let me get now a close up. Let me get a close up right here. You can see this, okay? These are the 10 foot grounding rods with the, uh, now this wire is going somewhere over here and connecting yep. to the tower itself. Yeah, connects to the tower. And then, and then there's one back in the back. Here's the other back one. up here a little bit. Here's the other one here, or this one over here. Here's, right here. here's another one right there. Yeah. And there's another okay. one underneath the leaves over here. All right, and then you're going to attach this brand new copper line. Once we get rid of this hoist system right here, speaking of the hoist system, let me show you. We're going to crank this baby up. And once he gets it up there and he gets all the bolts in it and gets it secured to where it's vertical, he'll be removing this in the next couple of days, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And uh, this copper wire will go where the screw is that's holding this, this, uh, this uh, support, brace. support brace. Okay, so he'll have an even more. So that takes care of the tower. Let's follow this back. Now show me what else you got. This is the last ground rod I drove. And this one goes back. No, that's the one that's going to go over here to this bar. Yes. Yeah, it's, okay. It's connected with a ground wire over there, but the ground wire continues through here and connects to. Now, which ground wire? Okay, we're talking about the brand new the copper brand wire. Brand new copper wire. Okay, we'll come and it across. It connects into here. There's also two other wires that are under the ground mm -hmm. that go. They're connected in with those other with wires. With those 10 footers yes. that are down into the concrete, yeah, into the ground. Into there. This I added, but just because I could, because I was going to have the ditch open again. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a ground rod here. This is one of the original rods. This is one of the original rods. And uh, well, this one. Wait, wait, back up. The original rods for what? The original rods when I put this up uh, 24, 23 years ago. Okay, I mean, let's back up here now. Are you saying this is a... Uh, you took down the old tower and you're putting this new one yes. in the same place. Yes. Now, so you poured this concrete 20 years ago. Yes. Oh, okay. I thought this was something new. No. That's, oh, that's, okay. That's been there so you're just refurbishing the entire thing with a brand yes. new tower. And, oh, tower. okay. Well, that new puts tower, brings me up to date. I thought you just did that. So ground rod here, ground rod here. Now these are... Eight footers? These are eight footers. Okay. No, these are six footers. Six footers. These okay. are the small, smaller six footer rods. And this is another one. Uh huh. And there's another one under the ground over here. So you're well grounded then, it's aren't you? It's tied in. Now, right here, over here, you'll see where the wires, right here, the ground wires, they're going to run into the house. And that's what's going to give you your go to earth, the shack. earth ground to the shack, to your transceiver and whatnot, right? Yes. Well, that's fantastic. Now, let's talk about this gray pipe. What is that all about? Why, why is this here? And it has a, uh, a head, what do they call these things? Electrical Weather head? head? Weather head, yeah. Why is that there? Weather head. It's, uh, it's so I can transition from outdoors for my cables. That's what you're going to run your tower, cables. When the yeah. tower's up, I'll transition. I'll bring the cables in. They'll run through the conduit okay. into, the, uh, into the shack. I'll show you what uh, goes under. Come on, fingers. A little chilly out here today. Underneath here, this is another one of my little... What is that all about? This is stainless steel scrubber pad. And uh, you plan on washing this thing once a week or so? <laughs> <laughs> There's a hole here that you have to put where the uh, cables come through. Right, right. Mice like to get into things around here. Yeah, in oh, fact, I see, okay. In fact, the last conduit that I had in, uh -huh. I, I left left it slightly ajar where I, when I ran the con oh, mm -hmm. cables through mm -hmm. and they ended up chewing my wires in two oh, inside. That wasn't so, nice of them. So this, <laughs> this goes into here 
Now wait a minute. Let's back up here a second. This is this already run inside the house? Yes. Okay, so this is this pull. is what that's just got you got to pull it through with. That's okay, all right. You're gonna hook your wires up and pull them through with that's, that. That's the pull string. And this and this here is to keep the mice out. It keeps the mice. Or out. the bugs, or the you know the all mud wasps and all that stuff, right? Well, that's pretty that's good. That, pretty. That, that, that keeps them. That gives it. Put something in there, and the mice do not like to okay. chew. Okay. Now we're talking stuff. about when you say cables, we're talking about these babies right Those here. Three cables Those three there. cables there that are coming down from the tower. Two coaxes and the, and the uh, well, rotator control cable. I'll tell you what. Uh, what do you say we crank this baby up now? Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. I think we've covered just about everything. I had no idea that you poured this 20 years ago. I thought this was something brand new. I when I built the house. Well, how tall was the original antenna? It was uh, uh, 56 feet. The, the tower was 56. I mean, why did you change it? Just because the tower got rusty and old and shot to pieces? It got or old and got weak. It, and it after I put the garden in, I could not lay the tower down oh, anymore. Okay. And it didn't have a, a fixture on it. Okay. So I wanted something that I could crank up and put down when I wanted to. Did the original one have uh, guy wires or was no, it no? It, it didn't have. Self, and self what self. did you crank it up and down with? I didn't. I, I had to get a uh, uh, utility truck. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you used to work for an electric company, yeah. and they helped you put that thing up yeah, vertical. Yeah, when I needed to. The couple of times I needed to take it down and put it back up. They, oh, okay. Well, that's really cool. Well, that's it, guys. I hope everybody learns something from this. Uh, I tried. Oh, one more thing. I had a question. I had a question from a guy who watched my last video. Once you crank this up, what keeps the tower from coming down? Is there some kind of lock mechanism yes. here, a ratchet mechanism? Yes, there's a, in the, uh, this is the... Uh, no, I'm, I'm talking. Yeah, once you once you get once you extend it, what keeps it from going back? It, down? it, it locks the the pebble lock, and and just to make sure no one can uh, mess with it. Yeah. You end up you put a chain around here. I mean, how does it lock? It, it just has it's a, built into it. It has a built-in lock. You go it, one way or the other way now. Right. But it, it locks either way. You don't have to flip any levers no. or anything like that. Well, that's kind of an interesting thing. No. And the same way with the the, the winch that. Uh, the same thing with this here. Yes. Okay. When you crank it one way, it goes up. You crank it the other way, it comes down. And it just has an automatic locking mechanism yep. built into it. You can't see it, I guess. Yep. All right. I guess it's time to get this baby up. Is it going to be a lot harder to crank up than it was the first time we did it? Uh, I'm anticipating that it is. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Okay, let's get it up in the air and then we'll show you when we get it done. Sure. Alright, here we go. I am cranking my brains out. I'm first on the, on the handle, by the way. <laughs> Just to let you know. And she is coming up. It's not much harder than it was the first time without the antennas. Alright, Glenn's turn. <laughs> She's a going up. Incidentally, this will be the last time he has to crank this antenna up and the last time he'll have to extend it unless he has some kind of trouble. Other than that, this is it for him. He will soon be transmitting and receiving on it. All right, we're almost past the breakover point and it's really easy to crank now, even with all those heavy antennas on there. Piece of cake. Nine bolts. Okay. All right, Glenn's putting the bolts in one side of it. There'll be three here, big ones. There will be two more added to here and two more added to there. There'll be nine bolts holding this entire thing together. All right, here you'll get the idea of the, uh, the 40 and the 80 meter the inverted V's. They had, the wires have not been stretched out left and right, but you can see the beginning of the inverted V on there, and you can see the beginning of the inverted V right here, left and right, okay? Both sets of those wires, two of them will stretch out to the left and be tied off, and the other two will stretch out to the right and be tied off. Well, right now, Glenn is extending those wires for that 40 and 80. He's not going to raise the tower straight up. He's going to do that in a couple days. Uh, but he's, it does have the wires. He's stretching this wire, just getting them out of the way, basically. And right here is uh, what connects the rope to the actual antenna wire. It's just a ceramic insulator. This is the rope to tie it up. This is the antenna wire coming in. And again, Get yourself a hold of an ARRL antenna handbook 
and they'll tell you all about this sort of thing. He's stretching it on out right now. And that's about it from uh, Glenn King's residence, N5GK. And the next time we see this, the antenna should be way up. And we hopefully will hear the radios, uh, his transceiver humming and singing. Until next time, this is John.